Can everybody hear me? Yep. Yes. I tend to have a big voice. I got in a lot of trouble in high school for <laughs> having a big voice, but I want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you, Joan, uh, for that introduction. I want to thank the Board of the Kwani Historical Society for inviting me to speak tonight, and I want to thank you all for coming. Um, as Joan said, my name is Billy Steinman. I am a full-time Kwani resident, uh, a recovering lawyer, um, hopefully uh, faster uh, than slower, and I am a trained dark skies advocate and enthusiast. Uh, and we're talking a little bit about that this evening, but first I wanted to start with a little history lesson, uh, since this is, of course, the Historical Society. Let's see if this will work. It did. So once upon a time, not too far in the past, keeping Kwani skies dark was a patriotic duty and a necessary one. So during the Second World War, German U-boats, submarines, patrolled the East Coast throughout the duration of the war. And East Coast residents, like uh, all of us here, were required to use blackout curtains to hamper U-boat navigation. The U-boats would run up and down the coast, and the theory was that they'd be able to navigate and judge where they were on the coast based on the amount of light coming from people's outdoor lighting, but also indoor lighting in the home. So they could say, all right, well, not too many people. I must be in Quanagantog, or a lot of people I'm in Point Judith. So to hamper U-boat navigation, coastal residents were required to use blackout curtains. And we actually have a replica of an original World War II blackout curtain here, which the Historical Society has developed. And the idea was that you would put this in your windows and you could have the lights on inside. The replica, this replica, is based on an original which was owned by a woman who lived near the Breachway on West Beach Road named Janeth Dorsey. And she had an original, and it was used here during the Second World War. It didn't end up in the possession of the Historical Society, but this replica was created and very closely mimics what blackout curtains would have looked like during the Second World War. Now, U-boats during the Second World War on the New England coast were a real threat. In fact, the last naval battle in the Atlantic during the Second World War took place not terribly far from here in the Block Island Sound. On the evening of June 5th, 1945, and those of you who know your history, that's only three days before VE Day, right, the end of the war in Europe, a German U-boat number 853 sank a merchant vessel known as the SS Blank, uh, Black Point. And the Black Point was sunk within visual range of Point Judith, about three miles off the coast. Between the evening of June 5th and the morning of June 6th, the USS Mosby, and, or Moberly rather, and two other naval vessels engaged the U-boat and sank it in the Block Island Sound. And again, it was known as the Battle of Point Judith, and again, the last uh, military action in the Atlantic Theater during the Second World War. Now, the U-boat, U-853, is still located offshore. It's largely intact, although certain things have been taken from it. Its propellers can be seen at the War College Museum in Newport. So, dark skies, were important in history and important in wartime, but also, I think, important in peacetime. Now, we all know that Quanacantog is a special place, right? We love the beach. We love paddling on the ponds. We get spectacular, although a little hot, days like today. But Quanacantog's beauty extends into the evening. There's a photograph we took in December on Kwani Pond. You can see the uh, convergence of, I'm just looking for my notes because I have a bad memory. Here it is. Uh, I think it's Venus. Yes, here we go. Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter in alignment over Kwani Pond. All these, by the way, were taken with an iPhone. That shows you how beautiful this place is. Not anything to do with my photog photography skills. 
Also over the course of the winter, sunset on the dunes. And this is the full moon over Block Island Sound. We are so lucky to live in what is actually one of the darkest locations on the beach on the East Coast. Here you can see satellite imagery of Quanakintog. And look how dark it is compared to what's around us. Westerly, Watch Hill, Point Judith, Newport. So we really are quite fortunate. Unfortunately, our night skies and night skies around the world are under threat. And over the last 25 years, global light pollution, and when I say light pollution, I mean the inability to see the night sky because of outdoor, primarily outdoor lighting, has increased by as much as 400%. And unfortunately, light pollution continues to increase on average at about 2% per year. And you can see the effect of light pollution. This photograph is of the same house taken on the same evening. And the photograph on the left, the house's outdoor lights are off. Spectacular night sky, the Milky Way, which we're fortunate enough to see here in Quantic and Tog on most clear nights. But then you switch on the outdoor unshielded lighting at that house, and all of a sudden the dark sky is all but invisible. All right, let's have a show of hands. Let's see if we can figure out the percentage of Americans who cannot see the Milky Way. Who thinks it's 50%? Or greater? No, we're, let's, we'll build up to greater. Just 50%. <laughs> well, if we guess 50, can we stay our hands at 67? You absolutely. <laughs> I, I'm very flexible, and there will be no prizes, and uh, it will not go in your permanent record if you're wrong. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, let's go to 60. Do I hear 60? <laughs> 70? 80%. Eight, there you go. Joan gets a prize. 80% and it's growing. And it's growing. 80% of Americans can't see the Milky Way. Now here's the thing though, the protection of dark skies, although it is certainly about aesthetics, right? I grew up in rural Vermont, you can look up in the sky, the Milky Way is bright and brilliant and beautiful. This is a photograph taken of the night sky again with my iPhone just pointed straight up on our deck a couple of months ago, right? The aesthetics are wonderful, but protecting our dark skies isn't just about the aesthetics. There are a whole host of other issues that tie into protecting the dark skies. First, greenhouse gas emissions. Approximately 15 million tons of CO2 are produced each year that are attributable to outdoor residential lighting. That's 40,000 tons per day. Hard to wrap your head around that number, right? It's a big number. It's about the equivalent of CO2 produced by three million passenger cars per year. To offset the amount of CO2 attributable to residential outdoor lighting, we'd have to plant 600 million trees per year in the United States. To put that in perspective, that's three times the number of trees in Rhode Island. We have to do that per year, by the way. So residential outdoor lighting produces a tremendous amount of greenhouse gas. It's also darned expensive, as it turns out, both on a macro level and on an individual level. The United States spends about $3 billion a year on outdoor residential lighting. 13% of residential electricity, both light-related and non-light-related, is attributable to outdoor lighting. What does that mean in real dollars? Well, it's about 3.8 kilowatt hours per house per night. 
if we take national grid summer electricity rate and multiply that out for the rest of the year, it's about 100 bucks per house per night to have your outdoor lights on. All right, 100 bucks, or 100 bucks a year. 100 bucks a year, maybe it's a lot of money, maybe it's not a lot of money. To put it in perspective, if you took that $100 every year for the last 10 years, switched your outdoor lights off, and put it into an S&P 500 indexed fund, even with as terrible a year as we've had this year, you'd have more than $2,000 in your pocket. So, residential outdoor lighting, greenhouse gases, and darned expensive. 34% of residential lighting, so 13% of all electricity use, but 34% of our lighting in our homes is attributable to outdoor lighting. Let's put that in perspective. It is more than any other household use, primarily because people keep them on all night. It is twice the amount of electricity attributable to lighting one's bedroom. And this, is, this one blows me away, particularly because we spend so much time in our kitchen. It's more than three times as much as kitchen lighting. Again, because outdoor lights tend to burn all night. Outdoor lighting also has severe adverse impacts on health. Now this is a, a relatively new area of research and a lot of research is being done on this and the results are, are kind of scary. This is the scarier part of the presentation. <laughs> so exposure to even dim light during sleep and the studies equate it to having a street lamp or a neighbor's uh, outdoor lights outside your window with the shades closed. So just a little bit of light filtering into a room. It lowers the natural melatonin level in the brain, which as we know helps us sleep. It disrupts REM sleep, right, when you're dreaming. It increases your heart rate and it disrupts insulin regulation just by having a little bit of light coming in through your window. Now what does that result in? Well, studies suggest that that results in weight gain and obesity, increased levels of blood sugar, which of course can uh, contribute to diabetes. It causes all sorts of other metabolic issues and heart disease. Just a little bit of light. And we are not the only creatures who are adversely impacted by nighttime lighting. We are so lucky, if you're a birder like I am, boy, Rhode Island is paradise. Right, we've got at least 431 bird species in Rhode Island. And a lot of them are year-round residents, like uh, this is an eastern flicker and a downy woodpecker. This is a picture we took in our backyard over the winter at our feeder. And while these guys are year-round residents, we are also very fortunate to have a lot of migratory species, including a lot of songbirds, like this fox sparrow who visited our feeder in spring. Got a lot of great pictures of the fox sparrow. Between 365 and 998 million birds die every year from collisions with buildings. And sadly, 43% of those collisions occur at residences as opposed to high rises. And as you might imagine, light pollution is a major contributing factor. So not good for us, not good for critters. We also have a nocturnal neighbor that likes to avoid lighted areas. The Virginia possum, right, our only marsupial. You've got to love a marsupial, right? Look at that face. We were lucky enough to have two regularly visit our yard uh, in the winter and spring. That's taken by our wildlife camera. I'm a bit of a wildlife enthusiast. Now, why should you care if the possum will avoid your yard? if you keep the outdoor lights on? Well, a single opossum can eat up to 5,000 ticks per year in a place where we have a lot of deer ticks and where we have a lot of Lyme disease. So I'm really excited, we've got two, right? <laughs> Go guys. Something else about opossums, these guys are miraculous, right? They regularly feed on cockroaches, rats, 
mice and voles, a whole bunch of species that like to come inside in Charlestown during the winter. Here's the other thing. Opossums are naturally resistant to rabies. You hear a lot of people say, oh, there was an opossum. It hissed at me. It must have rabies. That's a defense mechanism. That's their first line of defense. The second line of defense is, well, playing possum. But that doesn't mean that an opossum is rabid. In fact, rabies is very rare in opossums. They have a lower body temperature than most other mammals, probably because they're a marsupial. And so they're naturally resistant. It is a net win having opossum in your backyard in Charlestown. Other nighttime critters adversely affected by lights. And I have to apologize to my wife for this slide. <laughs> Outdoor lighting is harmful to nighttime pollinators. What do I mean by nighttime pollinators? Moths. Now we generally think of pollinators, right? Honeybees, bumblebees, we see them during the day. They're not as active at night. In fact, they're primarily daytime critters. But that doesn't mean that pollination stops at night. Moths and other nighttime flying insects contribute a great deal to the pollination of natural flora and crops. And in fact, recent studies suggest that moths tend to visit more diverse species and pollinate more diverse species during the, day, or during the evening than a honeybee or a bumblebee will do during the day. And with bee populations increasingly threatened, it's important to do whatever we can to make sure that other species that are pollinating, helping preserve our, our food supply, are protected. And last but certainly not least, and I'm sure Scott's going to talk a lot more about this, nighttime lighting impedes science. And it also reduces dark skies tourism, which is a growing field. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with a lot of downside to nighttime residential lighting. Greenhouse gas emissions, right? harmful to humans, expensive, harmful to wildlife, impedes science. But the question remains, what's the upside, right? Is there an upside to nighttime lighting? And the issue that is most commonly cited for keeping the lights on in the evening, you can guess, right? Security, right? Crime prevention. But then we have to ask the next logical question. Does outdoor residential lighting deter crime? Interestingly enough, before we get to that answer, let's talk about burglaries. According to the FBI, 70% of burglaries take place during daytime hours. Why is that? Your work. Your work, right. I mean, before the pandemic, we were all at work. <laughs> right? Then we were home for a while. But now we're gradually going back to work. But here's the important point. There are a lot of studies trying to determine whether or not there is a connection between reducing nighttime crime and nighttime lighting. And a lot of studies have actually found the opposite. It seems counterintuitive, but the research finds just the opposite that outdoor lighting and more street lights can result in increased crime in the location subjected to more light. And research suggests that criminals may actually target homes with more outdoor lighting. Can you guess why? You can see. You can see, either consciously or subconsciously. Right, it's like the old joke. Remember, this is a super dad joke, right? Guy's walking down the street, and he sees a fellow standing under a street lamp looking around. And the guy says, what happened? The fellow looking around says, I lost my car keys. And the, fellow, the first fellow says, well, did you lose them under the street light? And the guy said, no, way down there where it's dark, but the light's better here. <laughs> I warned you, it was a dad joke. Right? They can see what they're doing. If you're going to break into a house and the house is lighted, then you can see the area of approach, things you're going to trip on also. 
What looks more suspicious than somebody poking around a house with a flashlight, right? So studies suggest that using residential light at night actually increases the risk of crime. Now, even if I haven't convinced you of that, even if I haven't convinced you of that, the next question has to be, is the benefit of deterring crime here in Charlestown, does that outweigh all of the negative effects we've been talking about that arise from nighttime lighting? And according to statistics from the Charlestown Police Department that they file with the federal government every year, the answer is pretty much not. We are so lucky to live in an extremely low crime area. The Charlestown Police reported to the federal government that in all of 2021, we had five residential burglaries, five. We have 3,438 homes in Charlestown. That means the probability of your home being burgled in Charlestown is 0.15%. And if nighttime lighting will deter that, which as I said, is an open question, probably not, but let's say for argument's sake, it would. The question I would submit is reducing 0.15% to some lower number or zero worth all of the negative effects we talked about, CO2 emissions, cost, adverse uh, impacts on human health, adverse impacts on wildlife, and the like. I would submit it's not. Now what then can we do? And this is the part of the presentation where you should all get out the notebooks I asked you to bring, take notes, and there will be a quiz at the end. What can we do? What can we do? Super easy. Light pollution is the easiest form of pollution that citizens can fix on their own. First and foremost, turn off unnecessary outdoor lighting. Now look, I'm not, I'm a dark skies enthusiast, right? But I'm not nuts, right? Maybe I am, but not about this. I use our, night, our outdoor lighting at night, right? Like if I'm walking the dogs before we go to bed, I turn on our outdoor lights. I do so because those of you who know me, I'm klutzy. And if I don't turn on the lights, I'm going to fall off the deck, trip over the dogs, right? So I flip them on. I come home, or I come back inside, I flip them off. If we go out to dinner, in the days when we used to go out to dinner, if it's a particularly murky light, I'll switch the lights on so that when we come home, again, I'm not going to trip on those stairs. I don't have to fumble for my keys. But then when we go to bed, we turn them off. If you are in the market for new outdoor lights, very easy. Select fully shielded, meaning you can't see the light bulb, downward facing lights. This is actually the model we have at our house. They come in pole mounted, also wall mounted sconces, right? And eliminates that light that diminishes the light sky or the night sky. If you're looking for night lights, look for this seal of approval. The International Dark Sky Association reviews lights available on the market. You can actually go to the website, and there's a whole section on IDA approved outdoor lighting. And that's actually how we found the ones that we use. Avoid, if you can, and this is kind of a bummer, lights like the classic New England onion lamp. Right? These are great. Right? Developed in New England, classic kind of New England look. The problem is they use clear glass, right? So the light bulb is fully exposed. It's not downward facing, very blinding, produces a lot of light pollution. Now, increasingly, folks are buying wall sconces, wall mounted outdoor lights with opaque, kind of um, fogged glass. And a lot of these are marketed as dark sky compliant. Now, they're better than lights like the onion lamp with clear glass. They do reduce some of the glare, but they're not downward facing. And they do result 
in blocking out the night sky. If you've ever stood next to a house that has these and tried to look out at the Milky Way, you're going to find that it's going to obscure it. Now, if you're not in the market for new lights, I have a super easy, inexpensive solution. Motion detecting light bulbs. You can go to Home Depot or hop on Amazon, and for five or ten dollars, you can get a pack of light bulbs that will screw into any standard fixture, keep the switch on, the lights will stay off unless it detects motion near the light. And then it'll come on for a set amount of time. This is probably the easiest fix. And particularly if you're security minded. I know I haven't convinced some of you that night lighting really doesn't help much with security. So if you still feel the need, put in a couple of these. Your lights will come on if somebody unwanted or an unwanted critter approaches the house. And it accomplishes the same thing at a fraction of the cost. Fraction of the cost. Use dimmer light bulbs. Those also help to prevent the glare, even if you've got downward facing light. We tend to use 30 or 40 watt bulbs outside of our place. Now, if you use LEDs, great idea. LED lights are wonderful because they last a very long time, right? So they're environmentally friendly. And they use a fraction of the electricity that incandescent bulbs produce. But when selecting LED lights, it's important to stay away from the white or the blue end of the spectrum, because boy, do those obscure the night sky. If you're buying LEDs, select something from the warm end of the range. You want something no more than 3,000 kelvins, which is frequently listed on the package as K. And most LED packages for outdoor lighting will have that on it, so you can shop more towards the red and orange end of the spectrum. You can also join the dark sky movement. If anything that I've said this evening interests you, piques your interest, and you want to do more or learn more, you can go to IDA's website, the International Dark Sky Association, and you can become a member. It's a 501c3, so your membership fee is tax deductible. And they'll send you publications about night sky awareness, or you can take one step further and become a trained IDA advocate and join the advocate network and become a gadfly and troublemaker like myself. I've also brought some literature, by the way, that I've put over here at the corner and also a sticker if you like to stick stickers on your laptop like I do. Um, we've got some I Love Dark Sky stickers. Ultimately, what I hope you take away from this is not just that there are a lot of negatives to outdoor lighting, but it's easy to fix, easy to address, and it's just small steps that make a huge difference, a huge difference. I want to make sure I leave time for questions, and I want to leave plenty of time for Scott. So I, I want to end on the following note. So this is the monastery of St. Paul de Mausole in saint rémy de provence in France. Now, saint rémy sadly, suffers from a lot of light pollution. This is a satellite photograph of saint rémy And you can't really see the night sky or the Milky Way from either the monastery or, or really from any place else in saint rémy Now, why, you might ask, should you care? Well, in 1889, the monastery functioned as an asylum. And a fairly famous patient at the asylum looked out his window and saw the night sky. Now, what this means is that if Vincent van Gogh were in Saint Remy now and looked out that window, he wouldn't see the Milky Way or the night sky. I think that's worth preserving. And I hope some of the things I've told you this evening make you feel the same way. Any questions? <laughs>